Hello and welcome to Exploring London, the series where we painfully, slowly explore bits of London. And today I'm serving you ships, I'm serving you maritime, I'm serving tunnels, I'm serving Brunel, I'm serving pilgrims. That's right, I come to the bit of London that you don't really know how to spell. It's Rotherhithe. If you've ever looked at the back catalogue of videos for this channel, and I'm sure that's something that you do regularly, uh, you'll notice that the most popular videos I make, relatively speaking, are the ones that are about the most famous parts of the city. Therefore, it stands to reason that if I ever wanted to make a success of this channel on any level, then I would make videos about the most famous parts of London. Anyway, Rotherhithe is in the southwest quadrant of the city. It's across the river from Wapping, where a few videos ago we did a bunch of stuff about Execution Dock. And it sits on the edge of one of the lumps in the river course. You know, those lumps, those lumps, those river valley humps. Check it out. I really like Rotherhithe, especially at this bit. This is rather uncreatively named Rotherhithe Street. Um, and interestingly, in several sources, it's named the longest road in London. Um, and it does run all around the area, although nowadays there are some bollards that would stop you driving all the way through it. But at one and a half miles, really? The longest road in the city? I guess it depends on your definition. Like, if a, if a road changes name, is it the same road? If you take the main road heading north out of Islington, you'd eventually hit Edinburgh. So... So Rotherhithe is just very quaint. It's all cobblestone streets and trees and residents only on street parking and you think somewhere in London would just be getting busier and busier but Rotherhithe a lot more like my social life it's actually getting quieter and quieter as the years tick by. The rise and fall of Rotherhithe really lies in the rise and fall of the usefulness of the Thames. The main plot line is how basically it was a mecca for sailors and ships. Its name is a Saxon reference to a wharf for sailors or livestock or something. And it didn't grow in that kind of hub and spoke model, but rather it grew like a kind of, like a mould clinging to the, the border between the river and the land. Part of the reason for that is all the inland bits were quite marshy. They were full of rivers and streams. There used to be vineyards in there. That's not a joke. Vineyards in Rotherhithe. But it was totally useless as a place to build major settlement upon. The problem is, is that as time went by, the ships got bigger and bigger. So just like at St. Catherine's Dock and Wapping and Beckton and Silvertown and Woolwich and Deptford and Greenwich and all these places, eventually it just didn't make sense anymore to sail a massive ship into a small dock in the middle of a capital city. And a local industry collapsed and we built some flats and a few years later gentrification occurred. It used to be that the land in there was too useless to be worth building a house upon. Nowadays, there are two bedroom flats in Rotherhithe that sell for a million pounds. I wish that was a joke. Anyway, an earlier story I quite like is how Rotherhithe might have been the place where King Canute in the 11th century, oh, remember King Canute, Danish invader, stuck his throne into the shore, commanded the tide not come in, remember? King Canute. He might have used Rotherhithe as a place to start building his canal, which ran from Rotherhithe all the way along the Thames and enabled him to be able to sail his ships past the heavily defended London Bridge, which is, is so extreme that it's basically not believable. But it did happen. And, and it just puts everything into perspective. You know, King Canute built a canal through South London to defeat his enemies. What goals have you achieved today? If you wander along the river, especially at low tide, you'll see ghost after ghost of maritime relic, warehouses and old docks and shopping trolleys in the sand. In the heart of Rotherhithe village itself is the church of St Mary the Virgin, which is surrounded on basically all sides by the graves of sailors and captains. It was built in the 1700s and it was built by the same people who were building the ships in the area, so I can't go in because of you know, reasons, uh, but the supporting columns inside the church are actually the big tall bits of timber, like the masts of ships that are just covered in plaster to make them look more churchy, which is quite fun. Across the road from St Mary's Church is the Watch House Cafe, which didn't used to be a cafe, but it did used to be a watch house, a kind of um, police station associated with the church in the days before the Metropolitan Police existed. Um, it was positioned specifically so we could look out over the graveyard. This was the era of grave robbers, people who were going to dig up the freshly buried corpses to sell them on to nefarious anatomists along the road at Guy's Hospital. There was even a basement level where they could lock up the near dwells, but the whole thing closed down when the Met was formed. 
Nowadays they serve pastries and coffee, so I think we can all agree that we're generally happy with the direction history has taken on this occasion. And just next door is an even cuter 18th century building, this time Peter Hill's Charity School. Now, Peter Hill's is a mariner who, upon his death, left a bunch of money behind to help educate the children of the impoverished sailors of Rotherhithe. And the school ran for three centuries, just about, up until 1900, when the big bad borough of Bermondsey cruelly shut it down. But to this day, above the door, two improbably small children still stand guard haunting the dreams of anyone who sets eyes upon them and awaiting the day when they will reap their terrible, terrible vengeance upon the village. I think one of the most referenced places in Rotherhithe, understandably, is one of its pubs, the Mayflower. The pub, obviously, is named after the ship, the Mayflower, which set sail from here carrying about 100 pilgrims, determined to make a new life for themselves in what would become America. Except after they set sail from here, they landed in Southampton and they spent a few months in Southampton. And so I would argue the ship set sail from Southampton. But it started here originally. And so the pub, uh, which was renamed in the last century, is called the Mayflower to target the American tourist trade a little bit, which is fair enough. And you know the story, the pilgrims, about half of them died by the time they got there. Those that didn't die were helped out by the indigenous people that they met and eventually they all kind of got together, had a lovely dinner, which we now call Thanksgiving. And along with all the other colonists, they were so thankful that they began a centuries-long campaign of ethnic cleansing, forced assimilation and enslavement. You know, all that thankful stuff. The pub looks to be a lot older and claims to be a lot older than it actually is. Now, fair enough, there's been pubs on that site since the early 1600s, but it's been rebuilt several times. And after a World War II bomb, that one was built in about 1958, which is not actually that old. Like... Perhaps you are older than the Mayflower pub is. And, you know, if I stood in your living room and proclaimed you to be a piece of history, you might understandably ask what on earth I was doing in your living room. But then underneath the Mayflower is another Rotherhithe institution because it was under my feet from 1825 for 18 years that the Thames Tunnel was built all the way from here across the river to Wapping. Wapping. To Wapping. I'll link in the description below a full telling of the story because it really was an engineering marvel with more plot twists and turns than a series of Game of Thrones. Remember Game of Thrones? Yeah, I remember how we used to watch that. And now we'll never trust anyone to not let us down ever again, will we? The tunnel was designed and project managed by Mark Brunel, who suffered several strokes during its construction and needed to be ably assisted by his son, Eisenbard Kingdom Brunel. Well, like, he wouldn't look like that at the time now, would he? He'd have looked young and handsome and sprightly and perhaps not unlike myself. The idea is that it would link two of the major shipping areas and dockyards and avoid the trip all the way up one side of the Thames to London Bridge and all the way back down the other side. But it required building the first tunnel ever built under a navigable river, which necessitated inventing the shield method of tunnelling that the London Underground later extensively used. But the soft clay and quicksand of the Thames floor gave way several times and flooded the whole thing, and people died, and they used diving bells and tried to repair it from above, but then people started to get sick, someone even lost their eyesight due to the sewage and the fumes, and they ran out of money and just gave up for a bit. Then they finished it, but didn't have enough money to build the ramps for carts and horses, and so at its peak it was only ever just a pedestrian tunnel, which never generated enough revenue to make it a financial success. They tried with periods where they built shops inside it and they had carnivals and fairs, but ultimately a railway company just came along, bought the whole thing for 8 million quid in today's money, and now it's the overground. And yeah, the obvious comparison is that for the same price as a bunch of uninspiring Rotherhithe flats, they bought the most dramatically historic tunnel ever constructed. And, and just for a second, this round bit actually is the, is the original shaft. And what they did is they, they built the brickwork above the ground, then they, they dug out the earth inside it and underneath it and let it sink down and down and down and down until they hit the required level. And then they dug out into the Thames from there. And on, honestly, I can't emphasize enough. The whole story is just, it's just incredible. And some of the spoil from the tunnel, by the way, it was used to landscape the very lovely Southwark Park. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Of course, the tunnel we now more closely associate with Rotherhithe is the Rotherhithe Tunnel, a far less interesting roads tunnel that has the unfortunate pleasure of successfully achieving what the Brunels never could, meaningfully linking the industries on either side of the river. 
The long entry and exit ramps ended up displacing about 3,000 residents and it cuts a scar through Rotherhithe that I still think is an issue to this day. The other big problem is that the ventilation in there is so poor that walking or cycling do is potentially actually hazardous to your health. Uh, so we will not be exploring this bit of London today. There are other little tidbits of history that I just find amusing. For example, this children's play park, which I stood far enough away from so as not to get in trouble with any authorities, is actually situated on top of an old cemetery. Michael Caine was born in a hospital called St Olives that used to be here. This is the only surviving building. It was the first general hospital to have a psychiatric ward, one book claims. And then a little more towards Bermondsey is this place. This is King Edward III's manor house. It was built in about 1350. When it was built, it would have been surrounded by the Thames. Uh, and the remains of it are still here, where it's mostly used for people to walk their dogs on top of. And finally, I come to this oddly poignant memorial just across the road from the manor house. It depicts Alfred Salter and his wife Ada Salter. Now, Alfred was a medical doctor who moved to the area, which was at the time was fairly down and out to set up a medical practice. Famously, he charged very little for what he did. Uh, he helped set up loads of services to educate the local population and even helped them set up uh, mutual health insurance schemes. His wife Ada similarly did an enormous amount to help the impoverished locals and eventually went on to become the very first female mayor of Bermondsey. The memorial on the edge of the river shows an old Dr Salter looking out over his wife and daughter who's playing with her cat, except his daughter died at the age of eight of scarlet fever, a disease which was really common in the area that they'd chosen to move to. So whilst at first glance it depicts Alfred just having a nice day, what it really shows is an old Dr Salter staring out at the river remembering the better days of the family that no longer was. It's entitled Dr Salter's Daydream. Now, there is so much I haven't said because I've just skipped the history of all of the inland bits. We've just been hugging the coast the whole time. So do you know what that means? Yeah, I think you do. That means you have to subscribe for a part two. Here's what's coming up next time on Exploring Canada Water. Kind of, it's a bit much probably. If you're seeing this, uh, that means that I haven't filmed any of that by the time it comes to publishing this video. So I, I have nothing to show you, but um, it's gonna be great. It's going to be like explosions, just, just history coming at you. Um, anyway, like and subscribe. Uh, comment where you want me to go next um, if you want. I'm sure I will get around to that video in the next five years or so. Um, and otherwise, I will, uh, I'll see you next time. Have a lovely um, period of time. <laughs>